Thanks for having me back. Uh, Daniel Dean at uh, Concordia University, Irvine, and glad that the, the few, the proud and the brave could, uh, could swing through for another session of a kind of philosophical look at uh, virtue, apologetics, the ethics of belief. Um, you know, being a philosopher is a hard, it's a hard business because we, we, we go in two ways, and often we do this all the time. We either say something that is so commonsensical that everybody in the room is going, well, yeah, you're still thinking about that? Or we say something so esoteric that you go, I think I understood one out of every six words that came out of his mouth, and then even then, I'm, even there, I'm not quite sure I understood it because he's using them in such weird ways. Uh, and this is just the, the plot of, of, of the philosopher for which uh, they ended up putting the greatest of them, Socrates, to death. Um, so I know I'm, I'm safe from, from that charge uh, in this, this room, uh, but bear with me as we struggle through uh, some of these issues again and come out on the other side where I think I'll, I'll, I'll provide some kind of a practical take home, a practical import where you'll finally maybe see how some of this clicks together uh, uh, in terms of, of what is this ethics of belief and virtue and why am I talking about it here in front of you on a Sunday morning uh, this June 2nd. All right, so let's, let's, let's begin with just, just a brief quick review of where we went uh, last week. Uh, here's, here's the overall structure of, of the, the kind of uh, discussion for the last two weeks. Ethics of belief followed up by virtue, followed up by how, what this means, what these two concepts, the ethics of belief and virtue, has to do with apologetics. Uh, and we will uh, get, get there today, because uh, I am not going to torture you with one more week of, of these kinds of discussions. We'll get into the, some of that more uh, uh, fun historical stuff with Dr. Daniel Van Voorhis. Um, so if we, if we recall, we ended last week, or we, we began last week, uh, with this, this debate in philosophy called the ethics of belief. And the two proponents, the two major historical players in this debate were, were W.K. Clifford on the left there and William James, uh, yeah, on your right. Um, and and uh, their famous, famous quotes, here's Clifford, he gave us a story and a principle. His principle is, it is wrong always everywhere and for anyone to believe anything upon insufficient evidence. Now, what this meant for Clifford is he was literally saying that if you don't have sufficient evidence for your belief, you are an immoral person. Not just that you can't believe that, but that you ought not believe whatever it is we're believing that we don't have evidence for, and that it's not just something wrong with your thinking about a concept, it's that you're an immoral person for holding that belief without having evidence for it. Now that's a really strict principle. It's a really strict principle. I think there might actually be some, I mean, if we think about this in a biblical context, I think there might be some, uh, some biblical basis for thinking like this. I mean, for instance, if you think, if you think about, uh, 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 you know, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it, it's always frightening when people say this is their favorite uh, part of Scripture, because when you look at it, what's going on? Well, Jesus takes the law and he ramps it up to a level that makes it impossible, that makes it very clear that it's impossible. Well, I have not sinned. Uh, I have not harmed my, uh, my brother. But have you thought about harming your brother? Now, notice that. Have you thought about harming your brother. That is enough to morally damn us, our thoughts. It's part of original sin, and there's a whole theological context that needs to be explored here that I can't do because, uh, like, well, I'm a philosopher, uh, but I, I do think that this, this idea of the ethics of belief is not one that's just this far out philosophical uh, debate that there actually it comes home for us to, to roost in, in certain things that Christ says about what comes out of man's heart. Uh, so Clifford gives us a, a, this nice principle. William James on the other side, he says, this is what he says. He's going to take, if we're, if we're thinking of these as kind of our cage match contenders, we got in the, in the left corner, Clifford in the right corner, we got James who says this, I mean an essay in justification of faith, a defense of our right to adopt a believing attitude in religious matters, in spite of the fact that our logical intellect may not have been coerced. And by that, he simply means may not have been given sufficient reason to believe. So, so Clifford says, no belief without evidence. Uh, James says, you know what? We can believe without evidence. And in fact, we do it all the time. And we're within our rights, our moral rights to do so. And this sparked a whole literature in philosophy of religion discussing, okay, how do we manage, how do we govern our beliefs about religious matters? About the particular belief they were concerned with was belief in God. Clifford said, you can't have it, no evidence. James says, oh, sure, you can believe in God because it, it, it affects you at a deep level. Your passions 
are allowed to coerce you into believing about God. And so what we really see, and here's the take home from the ethics of belief message here, uh, at least the problem with it. What we really see is the conflict of what governs our beliefs. Is it going to be reason or is it going to be emotion? The passions. And Clifford says it's the passions. Clifford says it's got to be reason. Part of reason being what evidence do you have? Now, this has been picked up. I mean, this goes all the way back to Aristotle, this kind of dichotomy between, between reason and emotions, and, and it, it splits the way one thinks about human nature. It splits the way, uh, and, and, and particularly for our purposes here, what ought I to believe and how ought I come to my beliefs? Uh, uh, what do I use as my normative guide? What do I use as uh, uh, um, authoritative in the beliefs that I have? And so this is a problem, and what we're, what we're going to look at here is that I think virtue, and now we're going to move, we're going to move out of the ethics of belief a little bit here, uh, uh, I think virtue has a way, the idea of virtue has a way to help us kind of bring together this problem of a conflict between reason and the emotions in the way we think about, about the world, and then we'll link that to apologetics at the end here. So here's, here's two quotes uh, from Clifford and James. And we don't necessarily have to read all of it, but just the, this part that's highlighted here, it really shows us that there is a certain relationship between these two thinkers. Yes, they diverge on what they thought should govern the way we form our beliefs about the world, reason, passions. But they agreed that the process of forming these beliefs is very important. And one that although they don't investigate how we form beliefs, one that's, that suggests maybe we ought to take seriously that belief formation is something that uh, is procedural. It's something that we actually can manage. Sure, our passions might say, I believe this because it feels good. But that doesn't exculpate us from checking that belief that was formed in that way. So notice what Clifford says here. And the highlighted part, he says, uh, well, I'll read the whole thing because his is short. Yet, inasmuch as he, and remember this is in reference to this idea of the ship owner, had knowingly and willingly worked himself into that frame of mind, he must be held responsible for it. So it's that knowingly and willingly worked himself into that frame of mind. You can do, we have some kind of, of, of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 we are part of the belief formation process. There's something we do and we can work ourselves into believing something and not believing something. And this is why, for Clifford, evidence is so important and why uh, uh, he thinks there's a strong link between what we know and what we do. Now, James is very similar in this regard. He says, and again, I'm just gonna read now the, uh, well, I'll read the whole thing. I live by a practical faith that we must go on experiencing and thinking over our experience, for only thus can our opinions grow more true. But to hold any one of them as if it never could be reinterpretable or corrigible, I believe to be a tremendously mistaken attitude. So Clifford and James are in agreement that we have to be very careful with the way we come at forming the beliefs that we have. That beliefs are the end result of a process going on in our heads. Now, they, dis they disagree on what's going to count as good evidence, this kind of passional nature or, this ev or, or the, the r logical nature, but they both agree that the way we come at forming beliefs is uber important. Now, this is where I think we can, get, we, can, we, can cat we can throw the ethics of belief off to the side and start talking about what it means may then to form beliefs. Because what we have here is both of these, these thinkers suggesting that perhaps... Perhaps uh, we don't have to necessarily worry so much about getting the rules of belief formation perfectly laid out. We don't have to necessarily have a, a, a kind of laundry list of check marks that we need to check off to make sure that this is a respectable or a, a belief. Because if we're the kind of person that forms good beliefs, then the end result will be a good belief. I know that sounds kind of odd, but, but what, what, what this, this kind of move to virtue is going to allow us to do is to focus on the character of a person and how we go about forming our beliefs. In a way, we're going to shift the discussion away from the clouds, away from this concept called belief and what that might be, and we're going we're gonna to refocus it more earthly in terms of 
there is a process of inquiry. There is a way that we go about researching or trying to uh, uh, investigate our beliefs. And within that process, there is room for what Clifford would call the rational or evidential side of things and what James would call the passional or the emotive or the emotion. And that these are going to come together in how we go at understanding the beliefs that we have instead of polarizing and to say, well, if you don't have uh, uh, the evidence for it, you, you, you are morally irresponsible in that belief, or if you're not forming a belief according to some kind of emotive structure, I and mean, that's not how Clifford would say it, and, uh, but, it but if, I'm sorry, uh, James, but if you, haven't for, if you haven't properly accounted for your passions, then your belief is, is irresponsible. We're going to drop that and move now just to this idea of what does it mean to form a belief? What does it mean to be a virtuous person? What does it mean to be a virtuous person? And well, we actually talk this way. I'll just read a couple, couple quotes from you. Uh, here's one, Richard Dawkins. Just to see that these people, I mean, in, even in the popular literature, they mix together the idea of knowing and doing or uh, 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 ethics and belief all the time. Here's Richard Dawkins at, in the New York Times. This is the New York Times, 1989. He was doing a book review on a book, uh, that, a book, I think, purporting to defend an intelligent design type position. And he said this, it is absolutely, to say, uh, absolutely safe to say that if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked, but I'd rather not consider that. There he goes. He's linking it right up, the belief and the morality of the situation. Now, Alvin Plantinga, so that, that's Richard Dawkins on the side of, of, of uh, 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 the, the non-believer. Here's Alvin Plantinga, on, a philosopher on the side of the believers. This is what he says. He says, what we see is that there are at least three ways in which a belief can fail to be proper. It may be produced by malfunctioning faculties, uh, by cognitive processes aimed at something other than truth, or by faculties whose function has been impeded and overridden by lust, ambition, greed, selfishness, grief, fear, low self-esteem, and other emotional conditions. So now he's talking about specifically belief in Christianity. And he's saying part of the problem with, with those who don't believe, uh, one way one might err if they don't come to a belief in God, is that they're uh, 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 bad character traits get in the way of allowing them to form good beliefs. Now, again, this is swimming in the weird world of philosophy. Um, so let's 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 just push forward into into virtue and see if we can't bring a little bring this down down home a little bit. I am going to follow uh, uh, this uh, philosopher from University of Oklahoma. Homa. I'm pretty darn sure that she's a Catholic. She's written some works in some Catholic uh, uh, books. Um, Linda Zabzetsky, Zabzetsky and uh, she wrote a book called The Virtues of the Mind, An Inquiry into the Nature of Virtue and the Ethical Foundations of Knowledge. And here's just, I'm going to give her definition of virtue, and then we'll look at the little pieces of it just to see how we might reorientate ourselves towards thinking about what does it mean, how do we form our beliefs, not whether or not our beliefs are justified or warranted according to some abstract picture. So here's the definition that, that Zebski gives us. A virtue can be defined as a deep and enduring acquired excellence of a person, involving a characteristic motivation to produce a certain desired end and reliable success in bringing about that end. What I mean by a motivation is a disposition to have a motive. A motive is an action guiding emotion with, certain end, with a certain end, either internal or external. All right, what the heck does that mean? Well, here's, here's the, the pieces to pull out. So there are certain characteristics that a virtue has. Now, the way that we're talking about virtue is, is it's, it's, it, it, you have to kind of conceive it as a, a, a habit almost. The first characteristic is this idea of an acquired excellence of a person in a deep and lasting sense. So we are virtuous in terms of the habits that we've formed through the age. Right, and, and these aren't just habits in terms of, well, I, I turn my coffee pot on in the morning, every morning, but these are the kinds of, of, of habits that stick with us. I mean, if you want an, of a, an example, and again, this is, this is good, vague philosophy that I'm doing here. Um, if you want of a, uh, an example of where this comes out, what do we see at funerals? Well, when somebody gets up there, I mean, again, not a good Lutheran funeral, because a good Lutheran funeral, got, we're going to get a pastor up there and, and talk about Christ and how this is not the end, but this is the beginning and, and that kind of stuff. But when you see the funerals on the TVs and, 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 and if you've been to, to other funerals outside of the Lutheran tradition, you know, you see, you see such uh, uh, things as somebody talking about what? The good of that 
person, right? This is the, these are the enduring qualities that, that people, us, remember of that person. What colloquially we might call their virtues. They're deep and enduring. They're what make that person, you know, Bob or Sally. And this is what we remember. So, so it, 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 it's a deep acquired characteristic. A deep acquired characteristic. Uh, it, it involves uh, all sorts of, of, of physical and biological mechanisms, but we don't have to worry about that. Now, how do we get it? Well, we get it through uh, hab habit uh, habituation. We get it through education. It starts at the home, moves into the school, and it's modeled for us. So we get habituated into these virtues, which is good news because it does mean that, uh, you know, despite the old saying, you can teach an old dog new tricks, uh, and this means that we can work on these things. And, and the reason they're deep and enduring qualities of a person is because we've been so habituated towards certain characteristics. Certain characteristics. Now here's, here's what I think uh, is, is nice about the virtue approach. Uh, it, Star three there, or point three, she, she suggests that this virtues require motivation. And she's using this in a very philosophical sense, uh, in, in suggesting that we have these certain dispositions. We have certain motives, which are emotions that initiate our actions. So we don't just, if you just sit and think, let's say I'm really hungry. You know, and, and, I, and my, 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 I'm, I'm hungry, so I sit there and I think about all the ways I could satiate my hunger. I just sit in my chair. What's eventually going to happen? Well, if I don't get off the chair and go to the fridge and get food, I'm going to remain hungry. My intellectual musings on the nature of food aren't going to fill the belly. Eventually, I need to be motivated to get off my chair and search out those things I was thinking about. And in this sense, that is an emotion. Now, it, this is hard for us to see because we tend to think of emotions as those feelings that we have. There's a phenomenal experience of love, pain, hunger even. But when we're using it in this kind of philosophical sense, it really is more like this disposition, this idea that we have, the, the will. You have a will, and when your will decides, you act. Again, this, is, this is odd. This is the way philosophers, you know, you're like, yeah, yeah duh. Yeah, I know, well, of course. Well, this is what we do. <laughs> you know, this is what we do. I told you, I, they, I, we err in two, two ways. One way being I'm telling you something so blatantly obvious that everyone's going, you're still thinking about these things? Or it's so esoteric that it's, you know, it's just, you, you have no idea what, what words, the, the words, you see my mouth moving, but you have no idea what's coming out of my mouth. <laughs> uh, that's the other, that's, you know, that's the split, the, the life I live. Um, <laughs> So this is nice though. And so here's, here's an example, you know, uh, the courageous person is motivated out of an emotional, out of, out of emotions, characteristics of that virtue courage to face danger when something of importance is at stake, right? I mean, a courageous person is somebody who's going to, to act because why? Well, it, it, the courage, we call them courage because they have the properly aimed disposition to act. Right? Because think about how courageous, I mean, Aristotle does this. Think about how the, cour the courageous person can err. Right? Uh, uh, you know, if you got the, you, there, there's ways that somebody can be over courageous. And we don't call it courage anymore. Right? Somebody who rushes headlong into a nest of machine gun fire. Uh, right? If you've seen, uh, uh, I mean, Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote this in uh, The Charge of the Light Brigade. This was also uh, illustrated in the movie um, uh, War Horse or the play War Horse. Right, you got the cavalry, uh, and what do they do? It's the, I believe it's the English cal cavalry. They they charge across the field. This is right at the beginning. What's that? Calvary. Yeah, the cavalry. They're on <laughs> cavalry. Okay, cavalry. Got it. I'm thinking. I'm, I'm moving. Trying to. I want to move quickly. Uh, so, what do they do though? I mean, you've seen this. You've seen the scene, right? They charge across the field, and what's on the other side waiting for them? machine guns. Now a horse with swords and maybe a pistol is not going to last against an entrenched, I don't even know what was entrenched in those, those machine gun nests, but some big gun, right? And they get destroyed. Now would we call that, I don't, I don't remember how the movie goes, went, uh, but if, if the commander knew what was on the other side of that field and yet still commanded his men into that, that 
situation, do we call that bravery, courage? No, we don't. It was brashness, and it actually becomes a defect of that commander that he did that. Same thing happened in the Crimean War with the Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, interesting tidbit, if you go to Wikipedia, you can listen to one of the first recordings of, uh, of somebody reciting poetry into a, a tube, and it was Alfred Lord Tennyson re reciting Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, same, same situation. Cavalry into... Machine cavalry, cavalry into... Yeah, not, uh, yeah. for my friends at home, I'm not talking about the church down the street. Um, <laughs> Charging into the machine gun nest. So these are the dispositions. What gets one up to act? Well, it, it's, it's a certain emotion within us. It's directed at producing a certain kind of end. Uh, whether that be a certain moral action, courage, or whether it might be an intellectual uh, 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 task, like forming a particular belief or researching a particular belief. So because it's a disposition, because, because part of a characteristic of virtue is this motivation to do something, and it's a deep enduring habit uh, that, we, that, we, that we train into ourselves, there is a certain success condition to virtue. I mean, that means that it, the, the, the virtuous person is one who actually can do these things. Right? The courageous person we know because we see it, because they're living it, they're doing it. So there is a certain uh, uh, success condition built in. Uh, and, and what helps gauge what is successful in terms of our virtuous behavior has to do with that motivation, motivational component. Uh, we have to be able to reliably bring about that aim that the virtue disposes towards us. I'm trying to use the language that, we've, that I've used in the, in the text here. Uh, and so, so we could see that this is neat because what this involves, and this is how we're going to kind of merge together the, the kind of uh, the Jamesian idea of passion and the Clifford idea of evidence. Because the only way we can be successful courageously or intellectually is you got to know something about the environment you're in, right? Again, the courageous person isn't courageous because they send their horses, uh, we'll avoid the hard term to say, uh, they, they send their horses into the machine gun nest. If they knew about that, that they're not courageous. So the courageous person is good at understanding how to evaluate a certain level of danger in a situation, and it understands the consequences of their various actions. It knows which dangers are worth facing and which are not. So there's this kind of management scheme that, that gets built into the idea of the virtuous person. I need to know certain things about the world and my environment so that I can adequately uh, 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 um, uh, motivate myself to be courageous or pull back, to engage in the intellectual fight to pull back, to order my life. And this is the way Aristotle talked about uh, the mind. You have to order it. It's a properly well-ordered mind. And Zabzewski is working within the tradition of, of Aristotle, so there's a, there's, I mean, it's really easy to trace her thinking right back to the to Aristotle with, with some with some with some caveats. She changed, she she directs it in a new way, which I think is very helpful. But the idea here is that the virtues, whether they're going to be intellectual, whether they're going to be moral, what they involve is a certain kind of habit of mind that is going to do something according to an emotion or a disposition within the self. So think of, think of the emotion or the disposition as William James, the passional nature of mankind. And then think of this, this last, this success condition, knowing something about my world so that I can adequately guide my passions, my emotions, my dispositions as W.K. Clifford. Because if I know something, if I want to be the courageous person, I need to be good at knowing the world outside of me. And so within the concept of virtue, when we don't get bogged down with just talking about what is evidence, or we don't get bogged down with just talking about what is an emotion, virtue allows us to blur the picture slightly and say, look, in the human, not in the world of ideas, but in the human, these two pieces come together in, a, in what we might call, what philosophers call, a person. That we are an emotional creature and a logical creature, and the virtuous one is the one who manages this, this literally conflict within ourselves at times, this, this conflict within well. And how do we get good at managing it? Hab habituation. Habituation. Now, 
just quickly, there, there are two types of virtue. There are the intellectual and the moral, uh, and we're not, gonna worry, we're not gonna worry, I'm not gonna do any kind of extensive uh, diagramming out of what the, the different virtues are, but just some ideas of what an intellectual virtue might look like. Uh, wisdom is the kind of, that's the queen of the intellectual virtues. Open-mindedness would be an intellectual virtue. Thoroughness, perseverance, these are very intellectual virtues. Um, on the moral side, these are the, 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 the big classic three, courage, temperance, and justice. Those are the greats from, from Plato. Uh, and, and both Plato and Aristotle will give you a list uh, that is you know, 20 pages long of the different virtues and vices that one can have. Uh, and actually through time, no one's really been able to agree on a kind of dyed in the wool uh, uh, list of intellectual virtues and moral virtues. Every philosopher picks different ones and says, well here, this is what we ought to strive for. Uh, so, so I'm going to leave that problem uh, for other people to solve uh, and just realize that, you know, I, I think it makes a certain amount of sense that we do have certain intellectual traits and we do have certain moral traits and we ought to try to develop them. This is odd, again, in the Lutheran context in terms of sanctification, but remember, we're, we're talking outside and this has nothing to do with salvation. What this lecture series has to do with is what is our role in culture. And in that sense, the kind of virtue I'm talking about on the moral side could probably be more akin to like a civic virtue, right? What is a civic virtue? Now, what is the link between the, the intellectual and the moral? Well, there is a, there's a logical correlation between the two. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is too much philosophy. Uh, but you can think of something like honesty. Honesty is traditionally a moral virtue. But the honest person is one who is truthful. So if you're honest by nature or logically, you must also be kind of a truthful person. And if you're a truthful person, you care about the truth, that means you're going to be exhibiting, a, you're, or you're exhibiting certain intellectual virtues well, because you're getting at the truth and you're honest with it. All right, so there's a logical connection there. And then there's a causal connection. And this is what we saw with the planning of quote. So remember, you know, what does planning a say? He says, well, there's three ways that we can ill form our beliefs, or there's three ways in which our beliefs uh, uh, can be tainted, and one of the ways is if they're overly influenced by uh, um, the vices, such as is what he, he shows us, lust, ambition, greed, selfishness, fear, low self-esteem. Those can have a causal influence on whether we form a belief. How so? Well, if you're an ambitious person, you might not really care about the truth of your claims, because all you're looking for is to move ahead in life. Right, and whatever this, whatever your job is, you're very ambitious. So you know that certain beliefs that you have might be harmful to your career, but they might be good for the for the business or whatever. I mean, you, know, you can think of our politicians here, right? This is the, this is the fight that we always have, and on our kind of step, you know, when we look at them when they're on the pedestal and they're saying things, we're always like, well, are you do you really mean that, or what is the ulterior motive in your in your speech, right? This is us questioning their what integrity honesty. Um, and so if they're ambitious, we all, I mean, we're, 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 we, we, it looks like we might be stuck in some sort of uh, um, uh, Watergate type scandal currently. Um, and what was driving that? Was it ambition? We don't know. But, but it's, it's playing fast and hard with what? Truth. And so one's character is influencing how they form true beliefs. Now, that last piece, soul management, that is this, this is the idea that uh, the virtuous person is the one who can manage these conflicting tensions within us well. The passional nature of James, the evidential nature of Clifford. We have to, we have to, have, uh, we have to be conscious, conscious that this is happening within the mind and, and that we, can, we do have a say and we do have a, a part to play in this. Uh, depending on, on uh, 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 whether we want to be the virtuous or the vicious person in terms of what beliefs we hold. So how does this, how does this help maybe, maybe bridge the gap between Clifford and James? Well, virtue accounts really well for the dueling intellectual and emotional natures of the traditional ethics of belief dialogue. So it offers the hope, I'm not going to necessarily give us that, what that management scheme looks like, but it offers us the hope that there's a way forward that we don't have to just side with Clifford, or we don't have to just side with uh, uh, James, and, and, then, and then basically stake our, our flag in the sand and draw the line and say, we will never cross that line, right? 
that we actually, there is a way to, to bring these two thinkers together who both seem to have hit upon very neat insights about what it means for us to be human in the intellectual world, meaning in the world of, of beliefs, in the world of beliefs. Okay, so, good, we're making good time here. We're moving quickly, but we're making good time. So how then is this going to help us with virtue and apologetics? Or how is this going to help us in terms of thinking about us as Christians in a secular world? Christ and culture. And that's the summer series here. How is this going to help us? Well, here is a, uh, I'm going to start by suggesting a way that uh, the old, that old model of kind of choosing a position, either going with James or going with Clifford and saying, that's what it is. You know, you can't have any beliefs that you don't have evidence for, or it's, or, or it's, it's passions or whatever. Uh, that way of thinking uh, uh, is harmful. And I'm going to show you how it's harmful before suggesting uh, uh, that we ought to be careful of that as, as Lutherans uh, when we engage uh, in the world outside of us. And remember, all of this uh, is, in, is in the hope that out of something, because you're the ones, you know, you guys are the ones that are, that are in the trenches every day, actually sitting next to, to the, the non-believer in your offices and working with them and, and doing these things. I have the luxury of working at the Christian University where, you know, when I left Florida State, my, 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 uh, my discussions with non-believers pretty much took a nosedive, you know, because I came to Concordia and they might not all be Lutheran, but they're all believers of some, some stripe. And so really, this is the idea here in this practical advice is saying, look, just when you're out there in these discussions, we don't have the answers, but it's important for us to engage. It's important for us to engage. And I'm not doing a good job at the university if I can't help train people up or habituate people into a way of thinking about the relationship between Christ and culture or apologetics uh, that has been influenced by what I've seen in you know, the heady intellectual world of something like Florida State where you know surrounded by uh, atheists and agnostics so here's here's where I think uh, a lot of the apologetic literature becomes vicious or here's where I think a lot of the apologetic literature is not virtuous and it's uh, in this little highlighted part piece of the text right here what does it say so this is this is uh, Zabzetsky Zet again and she's talking about virtue and she mentions this at the towards the end uh, she says but morality is also in part a project of making the world a certain kind of place a better place or the kind of place good people want to be in now this is an interesting piece uh, you know, and she's what this comes right on the heels of discussing that idea of the motivation and how emotions ought to play into our, our decision making and, and our belief formation. And so she says in the back of her mind, or, or you know, what is the project? What is the moral project? It's to make the world a better place. That's Zebzetsky. And she's, she's right in line of traditional philosophers on this. You know, we like to sit on our chairs and tell everybody how life ought to go. This is our job, we get paid for it. Um, it's, it's a heavy, it's a heavy burden, um, <laughs> but but here it is. I mean, and, and it's it, it's it's creeping out in her own kind of discussion on the nature of virtue. Now, I want to suggest that this this is this is detrimental. This ought not how we. This isn't how we should be thinking about the kind of moral project or or the way we relate to the world. We're really not after, and she should know better because she's wrote this just fantastic book on the nature of virtue where in the book itself, she says, well, I want to move away from the kind of uh, uh, idealistic philosophy and move down into the nitty gritty uh, 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 individualistic philosophy, meaning I, I want to move from the idea of say ethics of belief to the fact that we are people that have beliefs. So here she's slipping on the philosopher's uh, uh, um, banana peel and she's fallen right back into the world of, of idealistic thinking because what's the purpose of morality? To change the world. Huh, okay, well, if you're gonna change the world, that must mean you have, must have some sort of idea of how the world ought to go, right? And so, and so if that's the case, then you're no longer caring about the person anymore, as you were kind of t were telling me about, but now you're more concerned with how the world ought to be. Oh, oh, for the good people, right? For the good people. You know, this is, this is I, she, she, she likes Aristotle, but this is almost Plato 
uh, in Plato's Republic in the background here. Okay, so here's how this actually pans out though, and here's how this is why I think this is detrimental and how this has worked its way into. She's not an apologist. I mean, she's just doing heady philosophical work. Good, we need these people. But this kind of thinking has worked its way into apologetics, and it's what I call utopian apologetics. Now, this is a picture uh, of Alvin Plantinga, the guy I've already quoted. Uh, reformed thinker, uh, single-handedly, well, not single-handedly, there was a group of them, uh, but really did a lot of work in terms of revitalizing the idea of theistic philosophy. I mean, he, he's one of the, the kind of, he, he brought philosophy back for the Christian in the secular world. Uh, I mean, you've probably heard of Dr. Rod Rosenblatt when he talks about uh, the analytic tradition of philosophy and how it, it was in the 50s and 60s had single-handedly brought Christianity to its knees, and it had. Uh, this guy was one of the guys that was able to, to, to resurrect it uh, within the academy. So now you can go to any kind of philosophy department, and whereas before everybody would have unilaterally been unbelievers, any philosophy department you go to now is probably going to have one, maybe two theists in it. And when you talk to them, more than likely they're going to have been influenced by the work of Mr. Alvin Plantinga. Now here's what Plantinga says about his book. This is Warranted Christian Belief. This is what I read from just briefly uh, a couple slides before. But here's what he, what he says about uh, um, uh, the book itself. He says, this book can be thought of in at least two ways. On the one hand, it's an exercise in apologetics and philosophy of religion an attempt to demonstrate the failure of a range of objections to Christian belief. On the other hand, the book is an exercise in Christian philosophy. Now that sounds nice. That sounds good. Uh, he's writing a book. Uh, it's an exercise in apologetics. How do I defend my faith? And uh, it's also an exercise in developing or building a kind of Christian philosophy. And he's succeeded in this. He's succeeded greatly. Uh, I mean, basically here, I'm not gonna, we're not going to go into to his arguments, but what he does is he builds a philosophical system around the concept of th what is good theistic belief. And he makes it safe to be a believing Christian. He works really hard to make it a safe place within the academy, within the world at large, this is his apologetic task, uh, to be a believer. Then he shows that the other competing philosophical systems, so the systems that a Christian is going to bump into in the world place, uh, they can't account for their own rationality. There's something wrong with the other system. So what is another system? Well, the one Plantinga loves to talk about is theism requires a kind of supernaturalism. So Christianity is inherently a supernatural worldview. And what Alvin Plantinga does is he makes that kind of belief safe. He says, here's why we can, we can be supernaturalists in a world that is at root or at heart naturalist, meaning there is no God, there is no divine providence, there is no resurrection, there is no miracles. And again, he's swimming in the world of the academic philosophy department. So that, so that's the, that was, is the kind of reigning uh, uh, belief that they're, they're committed to this naturalistic worldview that just excludes God uh, at the outset, because belief in God requires you to believe in miracles, and that's irrational. So, so Plantinga says, "Look, here's how you can be a, a faithful Christian. You can have a properly, you can have a proper belief in the tenets of Christianity, and I'm also going to give you the tools to destroy that other position. I'm going to give you the tools to show that 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 actually, when they're throwing rocks at you and saying you're irrational, they're irrational." And then you can throw a bigger rock back, right? Now, why is this utopian? Well, we need a certain amount of this kind of work being done in the theoretical field. I mean, this is why he's at a philosophy department. You know, we need some of this stuff being done. But let me show you why I think this is damaging to the more prescient task of being a Christian in the world, uh, in the world itself and, and the fact that we actually have to have dialogues about this stuff. Here's how this pans out. Practically, here's the Discovery Institute, the center, this is up in, in Seattle, uh, the Center for Science and Culture, one of the main proponents of intelligent design. Now, intelligent design 
is a kind of research program in the sense that if it's being done at, say, a university or whatever, and they're, and they're doing marvelous things with whatever they're doing, you know, or, or be he at Lehigh University or whatever they're doing, in terms of just talking about uh, uh, what, what it might mean for a designer to have created, say, uh, the little tails on the end of, of, of bacteria. Okay, great. That's fine. But... The problem is that theoretical work and that theoretical construct that say somebody like Planiga, it does trickle down into the popular marketplace. And so here's a, a fantastic exa example of where things go incredibly poor, poorly for, for a, a Christian apologist. An evolutionary biologist by the name of Jerry Coyne, uh, University of Chicago, a uh, smart man, uh, I read his blog daily, uh, and he wrote a column in USA Today called Science and Religion Aren't Friends. This is in 2010. Now, here's what he says. This is his claim. And this leads to the biggest problem with, with religious truth. There's no way of knowing whether it's true. I've never met a Christian, for instance, who has been able to tell me what observations about the universe would make him abandon his belief in God and Jesus. I've never met a Christian who has been able to tell me what observations about the universe would make him abandon his belief in God and Jesus. He's asking for it. And, and I don't mean that in, in like, let's, you know, here we go. You know, he, he's, he's literally, he's here in public, in the public sphere in the USA Today 2010 saying, what is your evidence? That sounds very Jamesian. I'm sorry, Clifford, Cliffordian. Cliffordian? That's not a word. Sounds like, uh, like Clifford. Uh, but he's saying, he's saying, give me the evidence. Now, here is what the uh, uh, Discovery Institute um, a blogger by, by the name of Denise uh, O'Leary responds to this chart. She picks this up and she responds on her website. Here's her responses. Oh, you want evidence, Mr. Coyne? Here they are. The mind can evolve. Uh, you scientists are immoral. Look at ClimateGate. Look at the movie Expelled. Uh, and then in direct response to that passage, she pulled that passage out and she quotes this. Well, if one does not believe that one's mind has an independent reality, because that first point, mind can't have evolved. Mind being our, 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 our self, uh, uh, your soul, so to speak. Uh, because that can evolve, well, if one does not believe that, that your mind has this independent reality, one cannot tell whether anything at all is right or wrong. After all, if morality is all about survival of the fittest, then there is no morality, only survival of the fittest. Okay, now that sounds nice, but she didn't say anything at all, and she did not respond to Coyne's claim. What she did here, and notice, notice the, the planning of, is in there. What did she say? She says, well, one cannot tell whether anything at all is right or wrong. So if you don't believe in Christianity, and your mind, you believe that your mind is the, the process of evolution, you can't believe anything at all. Now, in some point of kind of deep philosophical theory, that might be true. Maybe. I think there's ways, there's arguments all over the place on this one. But Coyne asked a very specific question. What evidence would cause you to give up the Christian religion? Well, you want to go to Jesus. I mean, that's the way we ought to go. But in the public sphere, because Denise O'Leary taking secondhand this, this great work that people like Alvin Planning have done, she fights not for a particular case in the world. She fights for the entire system of belief itself. This is why I call it utopian apologetics. What is more important is the whole worldview. Right? Coin is, coin does believe the mind evolved. Coin does believe that evolution is the only game in town. Coin believes all sorts of these kinds of things. And those beliefs need to be discharged before I give you my evidence for Christianity. This is problematic. This is problematic. Because what's happened here, a uh, pastor did a, I mean, a fantastic sermon today. Uh, this is an idol of the heart. And if you haven't been to, to the service yet, you'll hear it in his sermon. But this is an idol of the heart. We've built people like Planning Up, people like uh, Denise, uh, not Denise, but the, uh, well, she, she's falling into the second hand, like the Discovery Institute, have constructed a certain way that Christianity ought to be. And now we're no longer caring about people, but we're caring about the system. 
right? I mean, because because Denise was was engaged. Who who asked the question? A person. And how does she respond? Not by addressing his actual question, but by falling back to a defense of this entire great thing we call Christianity, really what we call theism, because she never mentioned Christ once. So I'll give her theism, but I won't give her Christianity yet. This, this is bad news bears. This is bad news bears. Uh, you know, because when we start committing ourselves to systems and not the people, so, so if I want to put this into the virtue language, her motivation is wrong. Her motivation is wrong. She doesn't really, truly care about Jerry Coyne. So when we build our utopian type apologetic schemes, what ends up happening is we end up viewing, we lose a sense of the other person. We lose a sense of the other person. The other person becomes a pawn in some sort of game that we're playing. They're no longer somebody to talk to about the, the, the gracious nature of Christ, but they're somebody that we have to defeat. Because once they're defeated, then maybe they'll see the light of, of our system. And this is, this is, this is, this is, this is troubling to me because how in the heck are you ever going to have an, a genuine and honest conversation with somebody if they're, the entire mindset is one of destruction, right? They throw a pebble at me and I reply with a sledgehammer, the conversation's going to end pretty quickly. It's going to end pretty quickly. I might win, but for what end? For what end? In a way, it cycles back into a weird viciousness of egoism. I've preserved my safety. I feel good about my argumentative skills with this person. And then these things happen in debates with people, you know, whole audiences of people, and not only do we get gener we, we, a certain way of approaching apologetics becomes entrenched in the, the population. And utopian apologetics, I fear, is the kind of mainstay going right now. I mean, it, you know, this is, this, is, this is the William Lane Craig. I mean, I, I, I respect these guys greatly because they've done really marvelous work. But when you watch them in their debates, this is what they do. They seek and they destroy. And there's a place for that, perhaps, in the debate. The problem is, like with planning a, what trickles down is a certain ethos or a certain way that we then view the virtue of apologetics as a seek and destroy mission. And it's not. It's not. Uh, apologetics is motivated by our care for that other person and particularly our care for that other person's eternal salvation. And so we, we need to be, you know, as the suggestion here, uh, if we think about uh, virtue apologetics, uh, it's not really virtue apologetics, maybe virtue and apologetics in, the, in terms of the ethics of belief, this bringing together. You know, if we set as our kind of motivating aim the, that we care for that person's eternal salvation, then we play the, the uh, intellectual game differently than the utopian apologist. We play it at, out of uh, the success conditions are always going to be focused on getting and driving to Christ, right? The virtuous win is when you get the person to at least, for the first time in their life, perhaps open the Bible and read something from the New Testament. Or you have that conversation, or you preach Christ into their ears. That's victory. They might totally reject it. They might, so what? But it's better than winning the battle by saving the system. Because there we're actually allowing the word to do its work. Actually allowing the word to do its work. So I care about changing the world. I can, I can follow Zabzeski. I care about changing the world. But what I don't care about is changing the systems that I've constructed about this world. Whether they're Christian systems or not. I don't care about that. Let those fall. Let those tumble. What I do care about though is that person. And I care about their virtue. As a virtuous person, I want to make them. How do I want to change the world? I want to make them more virtuous. Well, this is, this is odd, because what do I mean by that? Well, I'm using it in a weird way that I don't think anybody's really used it before. I want, to, I want them to be fulfilled in the one who was virtuous and humbly 
died on the cross. And I can only do that if I care about that person. Now, this is just to, to, to bring this home with art and to kind of preview the next maybe discussion that we're going to have with Dr. Van Voris. Uh, this, is, uh, this isn't the Vatican City, uh, or it's in the Vatican. This is the Triumph of Christ. It's on the ceiling, and I don't know Italian, so this is going to be like a weird Spanish and maybe Latin uh, 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 pronunciation. The Sala di Constantino, right? This is the Room of Constantine. And this is, this is the... The, the, the ceiling of it. So all across the walls, it was, it was done by Raphael's school. Uh, Raphael started it, but then he ended up dying, so he couldn't finish it. He actually had drafted some of the drawings. And basically, you have all of kind of Constantine's triumphs. You know, he brings Christianity uh, to the Roman Empire. Um, and, he, and he's got all of his triumphs on the, on the walls of the, of the room. And then as you move up towards the, 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 the top, uh, in the spandrels, the spandrels are those, those kind of triangular pieces there. When you put arches together, there's this extra space, and they're called spandrels. Uh, and they like to put lots of pretty pictures in them. Um, uh, you've got the virtues. So you move, from, you move from the earth into the virtues. And then what's at the center, which I thought was just fantastic, and this is a closer picture of that, just the center, what's literally on the roof, is you've got Christ hanging on the cross. And you've got uh, uh, the paganism or, or philosophy or whatever you want to call it broken at his footsteps, or broken at, at the bottom of the cross there on, on the, uh, the, the tile. And so what this shows us is that even no matter which system one commits to, I mean, Constantine's empire was, was vast, uh, but it still fell and it still crumbled. So no matter what kind of Christian systems we build up, they're all shattered at the foot of the cross. Even our Christian systems, even our beloved Dogmatics that we as Lutherans love so much. Mueller, uh, Peeper, shattered at the foot of the cross. And so, when we're thinking out, now I'm not saying this isn't important, that stuff isn't important. What I am saying is when we're dealing with the outsider, when we're dealing with the world, we have to have the courage to not defend the system, but go after what's more important because what is sitting, what is sitting, at the head of all these systems that we have built and actually shattered every single one of them is Christ, his death, and his resurrection. So uh, the way that virtue helps us keep this in focus is it reminds us that we don't have to worry about these abstract conceptual schemes that we call Christianity or theism, but that we narrow and we focus in on what is that person, what is their needs, wants, and desires, what do they want or how can I use their discussion to turn it in towards, to turn it towards a conversation about Christ, his death and resurrection? And this is challenging. This is dangerous. This is, this is, this requires courage on our part and virtue on our part because it's not, it's scary. You put yourself out there. It's easy to defend a system. And once, if you fail in defending a system, you can walk away and say, well, okay. You know, I'll, I'll, I live and learn and I'll, I'll go fight another day. But there's more at stake when you fail uh, in, in, in getting at Christ because now we're dealing in the realm of eternal salvation. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying this to, you know, say, well, now go out and do it and, and, and uh, there's, there's moral reprobation for it. Uh, or you're a moral reprobate if you don't because like uh, everything, the what I'm presenting here in a way is a kind of way of thinking, a system of thinking about apologetics influenced by virtue. And that itself when we fail and we realize that we're not the virtuous person because we failed in these endeavors, we're shattered at the foot of the cross. And we fall back on that redemptive grace so that we can go out the next day and have the same conversations with these people again. Um, with that, I think I, I'll leave it. Uh, picking up on this theme of kind of art, uh, uh, next week we have uh, Dr. Daniel Van Voorhees is going to be looking at Luther, Melanchthon, and Cranach. Uh, the Voice, The Professor, and The Artist, Reflections, and the Spread of the Ref Reformation Through uh, Popular Mediums. And so we're going to pick up this idea of art. I mean, this is just my end piece here. Uh, but Dan will, will, will investigate a bit more, more, more uh, fully how art itself is a medium of Christianity. And I will open it up for, for questions here. Um, uh, thanks for, for having me, and, and let me know uh, what you're thinking about it. 
Uh, I want to put in a, a good word for utopian uh, apologetics. Um, yeah, I, I, Coyne's comment, here, here's the thing that bothers me about that, that whole final argument. Coyne's comment struck me as incredibly naive, uh, uninformed, and uh, in some ways it represented his, his unwillingness to even consider the alternative point of view. Because you see, I don't know how many times logical positivism has to be defeated, <laughs> right? He made this claim that unless I can give you an observation that would falsify my belief, then somehow it's meaningless. Well, one thing that's absolutely not falsifiable by observation is the claim is that, claim, that yeah. I must oh, yeah. right, provide an observation to falsify things in order for them to be meaningful. Good. Right, that, that proposition is, is meaningless if true. Right. So why on earth do you have to treat that remark with any, why do you have to dignify it at all with any well, kind of a response? It seems to me that Coyne is never going to, to convert. That's, he, he's, he's probably financially oh. <laughs> uh, right, <laughs> yeah. opposed to converting. If he, if he converted, right, all his book sales would go to heck. So that's right. That's right. So 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 uh, to me, the, the 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 what it's about is not is having the people that are listening to him right. not right. be right bowled over by his brilliance, right. which like from that comment yeah. is non-existent. <laughs> no, that's right. That's good. I mean, that that is the that is the, the key because I think I am more worried. I mean, this is you're getting habituated into a, a, a way of thought. Uh, in a way, is more, I'm more concerned with the ones listening to the debate. Right, than actually the debate people themselves. Uh, and I'm, I'm more interested in, in how, uh, what they're taking from it. And so that's why I, I developed, I mean, Coyne is a professional uh, evolutionary biologist, so, but he's also a very prolific popular writer. And his blog gets hundreds of thousands of hits uh, monthly. So he is, in a way, habituating people into a way of thought. Now, I'm not going to be so down on the, the logical positivism or even Clifford's uh, uh, evidential criterion, as, as, as some might be. <laughs> uh, I tend to think that there's a lot of good uh, that, can, that comes out of thinking that way, even if I can't justify the principle itself. The move to virtue, I think, gives me an out, whether it be vague or, or, uh, or not, uh, where I don't necessarily have to deal with those ultimate justifications of that principle because I'm moving to the way we actually form beliefs. And one of the ways we actually form beliefs is to, to consider the evidence. Now, you're probably right that Coyne is not going to, uh, is using that as a, uh, you know, a foil. He's not, he's, not, he's not really ever going to, I could flip the question around and ask it about evolutionary biology, and he's, he'll, he'll list off maybe a couple observations that might uh, warrant him discrediting it, but he'll, but he'll more like James, his passional nature is going to keep him firm in his evolutionary thinking. Uh, so what do we do with that? Well, nothing. Nothing. But what concerned me in this case was more of the ethos of the discussion that took place when Denise O'Leary, who's not an academic, who's a journalist and a popular writer, takes the common talking points of, say, Alvin Planning, uh, William Lane Craig, uh, uh, and these guys, and when when somebody at least in, is asking the question, we do have answers and we do have responses to that question. Why didn't she give them? Why didn't she give them? She went immediately to the talking points. Who's, oh, here. I've got the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, uh, my husband and I have a very old, old friend who is a very passionate atheist. And he uh, always points to, well, he's always recommending Dawkins mm -hmm. to read. And uh, people who believe anything are all idiots. And, uh, and look at how many hundreds of different religions there are and how could you all think that you're all right. And, right. and what I tried to do, and you tell me if this is any kind of an argument, uh, is I said, you know, you have your own faith system as well. It's called narcissism. Okay. <laughs> you believe that you have the capacity to understand all that is understandable. Right. And that is a faith, that is a leap. Mm -hmm. And what you have to do is to be able to be generous enough with others to believe when they believe whether, and this is, this is where for me it's, it's difficult, you kind of almost have to defend all religion in order to defend the right to believe in something that is outside of your own knowledge. Mm -hmm. you know, to be, to, you have to defend the Muslim 
to say that they have the right to believe that their own narcissism doesn't guide them, that they do not propose that they have the all of the answers within their own psychological ca capacity, right. but rather that there is a belief, and that to believe that you have to, that you have all the answers inside your own intelligence is a, is a faith, and there is no proof there. That's right, and 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 so that's where the the utopian apologetics actually does a really good job, and and I like I said, they're worth they're worth. Uh, reading that I'm glad people are are doing that project. I wish they would just keep it in the philosophy department and maybe write popular philosophy books, not popular apologetic books, geared off that methodology. Because what they can do, what they do so well, as Dale has shown me uh, relentlessly, uh, with uh, the self the self refutation of various uh, claims, uh, they show where the holes are in that other system, and they do it with excellent skill, so that. There is a way where you can go on the attack, and depending, and this is why I, when I take virtue and apologetics, it really is more a kind of an ethos of how to proceed in this conversation. And you've hit it on the head in terms of one of the things one has to break down at the outset is this kind of narcissism, or what I would call arrogance, in the fact that most people think, yeah, I got it all figured out. My system tells me what the right answers are. So if you can, it sounds like you have good relationship with this person, and you can actually have these kinds of conversations with uh, uh, vigorously, and, and you know you can get in each other's face and things like that without turning each other off and never talking to each other again. Uh, the the utopian apologist will give you the way to 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 de poke the holes in their bubble, where it all comes crashing down. In the same way, but what we have to be careful and where we often aren't. I, I mean, I think you're on the right track because you've you've mentioned that you want to be humble in this. Our system can will do that as well. I mean, what he's telling you to read are the people that show where in our system they're putting bubbles that could bring the whole thing down. So uh, the problem with the utopian, this is the theor theoretical point, is if I if I destroy their system theoretically, philosophically, it does not offer one iota of evidence for my system. Logically, that doesn't follow. All that I have left now is a bruised and battered and probably very spiteful person because I've just destroyed their world instead of kind of inviting them into mine. So I think, I think, I mean, I, I like this idea. I like the, I like the language you're using because it is the language of virtue. Uh, and, and the, the, the problem, and this is why I said it's, it takes courage. The problem with this approach is it's scary because you're not quite sure where it's going to go. And there is no answer. There's no appropriate five-step formula to say, here's how to do it, right? You're, you literally are in a conversation with a person, and you're not, the aim is not to argue them into some sort of system, but is to get at what's truly important, or what James would say, momentous, and then have a conversation about that. And the paths to that point are legion. So we always have to be flexible in our, in our discussions. All right, I'm getting the, the, the goodbye from the president, so I will cut it at that. Uh, thanks for, for coming out. And if you have more questions, we can, we can talk later.